being joyful. Have you ever shot rapids? Anyone shot rapids? I like shooting rapids. I've shot rapids. I've done it uh, once without a boat, do you know, um, <laughs> in a life jacket. What do you call that when you kind of do a body thing? Body surfing? Down at, it was great. I was at camp, and these guys, I was about 18, and these guys said, hey, let's go, and we'll walk to this place. We know this great place to shoot rapids. And so we started walking, and then a truck drove by. And it had these two guys with long hair, you know, and a, and a fringe, you know. And they're like, hey, guys, where are you going? And we go, we're going to go and shoot rapids. Like, hey, jump in the back of the truck, we take you. And we jumped in the back of the truck, and we're like, yeah, this is cool. And they drove us down there, and then they went away. And we shot the rapids, that was really fun. And we started walking back, and a truck goes by. And it's the same guys. And I'm like, oh, out there, people are just going to drive around a bit, <laughs> not going anywhere. And he said, hey, let's give you a lift home. Where are you going? And we, there were some of the girls with us. You know, there's a boys' camp and a girls' camp at Pioneer Camp. And, I said, and we said, oh, well, we need to go to girls' camp first. And they went, girls' camp, party time, yay! And we're like, oh, no, what have we done? What if we get there? And he, it was all fine. That was my first experience. My second experience was in a canoe. I love canoeing. The closest I've ever come to properly nearly killing myself was in a canoe. Uh, I was a feckless 16-year-old, and it was, I was a good canoer, but I didn't really think about the season. It was October, and it was the River Thames, and it was running fast, and I got in and was struggling against it. They turned over. I just was clinging to a rope and the canoe, which I didn't let go of, and I was freezing, and somebody had to get in a boat and come and get me out, and, that's, and I didn't die. Hooray! That was good. So I was shot rapids in a canoe, and it's just exhilarating, do, do you know? Because you've got all the physical exertion and you've got a bit of kind of steering and thinking, your brain's going and you're leaning back and you're trying to make sure you don't tip and that it doesn't go sideways and you know, there's rocks and there's possibility of near death and it's just great and you're kind of going down until you get to a nice calm bit and it just filled me with exhilaration. I just remember doing it and laughing my head off. Do you, do you know? You're kind of going through thinking, oh, I could die! Yeah, let's go! So I tell you that to ask you, what kind of things give you joy? Have you got something in your mind that you know gives you joy? All sorts of different things can. It could be a success. Do you know? Achieving things, where you've worked at something and you've tried to make something happen and you've achieved it, maybe in athletics or maybe in something academic, or maybe at work, or in life. Or maybe you get joy from exhilaration, you know, jumping out of an aeroplane with a parachute, hopefully, uh, doing, riding down a hill quickly on a bicycle, that kind of thing. Maybe you take joy from comfort and safety, do you, do you know? Is your joy place where you're wrapped in a blanket beside a fire in your own home in a comfortable chair with a nice hot chocolate, and you're like, mm, this is it. This is safe. Do you take joy in your family? Is your joy being together with your children and your grandchildren or being together with your parents and your grandparents and your brothers and your sisters? Do you know just those joyful moments when you're all together? So there's something I want to say on being joyful straight out because there's some confusion about this because some people say different things about this. God does not want you to be happy. God does not want to provide you with a rich range of experiences so that you can tick them off your bucket list. But God does want you to be joyful. God wants you to be full of joy. And there is a difference. And I think it's important to see the difference right at the beginning. Now, when I say God wants you to be joyful, I don't mean that kind of Christian joy, you know, the miserable one, where, where you're deep, deep down joyful, so deep down that my face never moves and I just kind of mope around like this. God has given me deep joy. I mean real joy, do you know, joy that you enjoy, joy that you rejoice in, wonderful joy. God gives you joy. But it's important... I think, to differentiate between this joy and happiness just because of the way the world sees happiness and the, what we've absorbed from the world about what happiness is because our idea of human happiness might very well be quite different to the joy that God speaks of giving us. 
If you did a survey of everybody, what makes you happy, they would say having a great job or not having to work, or they would say being successful in life. They would say stuff, wouldn't they? I would be happier if I didn't have to work and I had lots of money. I would be happier if I had a bigger house. I'd be happier if I had that car. Stuff. Do you know? Think of the stuff for yourself. They might say people. People make me happy being around people. Happiness comes from having friends and family, that kind of thing. What God wants for us is that we would have the divine perspective. What God, the word divine is there, good. What God wants for us is that we would have God's eye view. And that then we would take joy in who he is. We take joy in what he has done. We take joy in who God wants us to be, and we would take our joy in being his people. That is how Christians manage to rejoice in the worst of situations, in the worst of circumstances. You've seen that, you know that, you read it in the Bible, and you hear of it around the world, that people are in dreadful situations, but they still have joy. They still rejoice in God because they have the God's eye view, the divine perspective. And that is why, I think, many people don't find the happiness they seek in wealth. They think that the wealth will give it to them, but they don't actually see who and how they are under God. What Jesus said about God and mammon, you remember? You cannot serve God and mammon both. You'll become a slave to one. It goes so much deeper, I think, than people think. I think it goes very profoundly into the human choice that we make because we are created beings and joy is found in being one with our creator and mammon which is often translated as money is more than money mammon is all that sucks us away from our creator Mammon is all those things that we go seeking after, including money, usually wealth, usually stuff, that we think we can please ourselves with, but they takes us away from loving and serving our Creator, who intended us, the created, to be one with Him. So, how do we know God wants us to be joyful? Because He tells us so. Now, I need you to brace yourselves in. Because there's a lot of scripture coming. There's lots and lots of the Bible. I love the Bible. I've been thinking about this. I could speak probably for 45 minutes, and I could tell you a great long story, and I could just use one tiny little phrase or verse from scripture. I could tell you a few jokes and a few anecdotes and give you a bit of self-help talking, and all you would get would be the wisdom of a second-rate comedian. And that's part of the problem, I think, with our, our Western culture our Western civilization, is that people are trying to get wisdom from comedians. They're trying to get wisdom from journalists. They're trying to get wisdom from YouTubers. And that's how you end up electing a game show host to be president of the most powerful country in the world. (laughs) Because they're seeking their wisdom in the wrong place. If you want wisdom, go to the Word. If you want wisdom, go to Scripture. Go and find God. God, in his word, and tremble at his word. So here comes lots and lots of scripture. Right at the beginning of Jesus' story, he brings joy. Oop, too far. The angel says it. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. The Messiah came. He is the Lord. He's the Savior, and that is joyful. And this is great joy, and it is great joy for everyone, for the whole world, for all people. Jesus brings joy to the world. During his teaching, he said, John 10.10, you should memorize this one, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life, and have it to the full. Jesus came to give you fullness of life, to give us the best of lives, to give us fulfillment, fullness. Jesus came that we might have life to the full. 
What does that look like, though? Because sometimes we could uh, have our own ideas, couldn't we, of what a full life would look like, what we would like in the fullness of our life. Because Jesus makes it very, very clear that this does not come with an absence of pain. Just six chapters on, in John chapter 16, this isn't always working. There we are. Lots of great words. He says, very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. That doesn't sound great. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come, but when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief. But I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. There will be pain. There will be struggles. But our joy comes through knowing Jesus. Through knowing Jesus, we are made one with our creator. We, the created beings, become one with our Father God. Our joy is in knowing Jesus, and it's a complete joy that no one can take away. So think about this. Is life a struggle? Do we have chores? Do we have pains? Do we have opposition in our lives? Do we have struggles in life? Yes, we do. Are Christians still being persecuted? Yes, they are. Do you know, in China last year, they passed a law that it is illegal to teach your children your faith. Can you imagine living in that culture? On the public churches, there are signs outside banning under-18s from entering. There are other churches which the Chinese government has legally been demolishing. They've been removing the churches. They are persecuting Christians. In Egypt, churches are bombed and Christians are attacked and killed. It is very hard to be a Christian in lots of places in the world. You know more places than I do. Just think of India and Pakistan and Nigeria and Sudan and Iran and Iraq. Just so many places where it is very hard to be a Christian. So does that mean that we've got it wrong? That we're doing the wrong thing? No, because these are birth pains. Jesus told us what this would be like, that we would grieve, that we would mourn, that we will struggle. But even so, we can rejoice. Even in our troubles, we can rejoice because we have Jesus. And we get a choice in this. We get to choose between God and mammon. Which one do you want? Which one are you going to serve? Who are you going to be? Are you going to be a slave of mammon or are you going to live for God? We get to choose whether we are going to live by the Spirit or gratify the desires of the flesh. That's so clear what that means, isn't it? Are we going to live by the Spirit or gratify the flesh? Paul talks about it in Galatians chapter 5. Verse 16, I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. We do what we want, don't we, when we pursue the desires of the flesh. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's all the difficult bit. That's living by the flesh. Just wait for this. Here comes the great bit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. The fruit of the Spirit is joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. 
that have not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. The fruit of the Spirit, this is what God grows in you. You give your life to him, you invite his spirit into, into your life, and this fruit grows. And what fruit does God want to grow in your life? No matter where you've come from or what you've been doing, you give your life to him, and he wants you to be changed, to be transformed as his fruit grows. The fruit is love. The fruit is joy and peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Doesn't that sound good? Who doesn't want these things? Who wants to say, no thanks, love, joy, peace, sounds awful. God wants to give us these things. These are the gift of God, the fruit of God that will grow in us. The God who created us intends this for his creatures, that we live by the Spirit. That's what we're made for. And this faith, is of so much value. You're choosing between God and money, God and mammon. This faith is worth so much more. It is of greater value than gold. Peter says, these have come, he was talking about troubles, so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That is God's intention for us, that we be saved, that we are one with Jesus. And this will give us inexpressible and glorious joy. That is our joy. Our joy is salvation in Jesus Christ's name. No matter what else comes, God wants you to find joy in your salvation. Now, you know, don't you, the world doesn't see this. They look across at a group of Christians and they say people who maybe could have been richer if they'd worked a bit harder or didn't keep on hanging around with all those other Christians. They see a a group of people who could have had week in lions on Sunday morning. They see a group of people wasting their their time and their energy and their resources because they don't have the God's eye view. They haven't realized they're creatures with a creator. They need the God's eye view. They need the divine perspective. We have it. We get to be one with our creator. We get to take joy in who he is. We get to take joy in who he wants us to be. We get to take joy in being his people. Happiness can be so fleeting, can't it? We chase after this bit of happiness, and it can be trite, and it can be light. It can just be a feeling. Joy is in God. God gives you joy. God wants your life to be full of joy, knowing him. And if you don't have this joy yet, you can have it. Accept Jesus as your savior. Accept him. Give your life to him. Put your faith in him and choose to put aside the desires of the flesh and live by the spirit. So, a couple of pointers from that. I made that slide. It's pretty, isn't it? I didn't take the picture. I just took it off online. There you are. Being joyful. Point us of being joyful. Stay true to Jesus. Turn to Jesus and stay true to him. Choose to serve God and not mammon. Do not get sucked into the world's trap of serving mammon. Live by the Spirit. Put aside the desires of the flesh and live by the Spirit. Call on him. Pray on him. Let his fruit grow in you. And you will. Find the divine perspective. See this beautiful creation in the way that the creator intended and be the creature you were made to be. And may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.